gathered here again on another Sunday, start of another week. We went to in our beds last night, Father, and laid down and got the rest that we did. And Father, you helped us wake up this morning. We got us started in another day. And we're so grateful for you, Father. We know you don't need sleep, but we do. And we know it's the way you made us to be refreshed and rejuvenated. And we gather early in this day like we often gather with you early in any given day to acknowledge you as Lord of our lives, to look to you not just to have blessed our agenda for the day, but to look at you and say, God, what do you want me to do today? Father, we know in your word that you call us not to forsake the assembling of your people. So we've gathered together today as a body, as a, as a congregation, as a family, as a, as a group of people who love you, people flawed all by sin, but people who have found grace and forgiveness in the blood of Christ. And today we are before you so gift we can never acquire for ourselves. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for knowing what we need the most and providing that for us. You are so faithful. We just pray, dear God, in this day to, to worship you with all of our hearts, to let you speak to us that we can, through this week, share with others who don't yet know you. Give us a burden for people who don't know you. A burden that you share. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. We continue our series of Jesus first and in everything, and we're working through the book of Colossians in this series, in a in a very powerful book, and a book where there is so much that you and I can find of that of, is of relevance in in each of the days that that God gives to us. And today we're in the last part of of the book of uh, Colossians, the first chapter. And if you have your your Bible, uh, whatever form you brought that in today, uh, if you can get uh, to those passages, will be. Um, Again, in Colossians 1. You know, most of you enjoy seeing a mystery play out. I grew up being a person who loved to read, and my dad started bringing these books home when I was young, and they were the Hardy Boy books. And some of you are familiar with these books. Maybe some of you much younger, maybe aren't. I don't know. But um, I spent a lot of time with Frank and, and Joe Hardy in Bayport, and uh, helping, uh, working with them to, to solve these great things that they got involved in. Um, I don't know how many of those books that I read growing up, but I found a lot of enjoyment in those as they work together to solve mysterious cases. And many of you enjoy um, mysteries as well and all the different forms they come. Even a crossword puzzle or a jumble has an element of mystery to it because you're finding things you're trying to solve something and maybe you find some intrigue and some motivation and to do those kinds of things some of you like movie mysteries you like to watch things like the fugitive or sherlock holmes or the girl with a dragon tattoo and all these these mysteries that just kind of grab a hold of you and you just think yeah i, I love watching this work out and you kind of get this clue and this hint and you kind of wonder is it going to work out this way and Fortunately for most of us, there's some resolving at the end of a mystery that, that kind of lets you know what really happened. I hate those ones that just leave you hanging, though. You know, I just solve the thing, please, you know. I, I got to go on with my life. You know, I can't handle this. But, you know, we like the challenge of, of a mystery. You know, the gospel, the story of Jesus coming to earth to save us, is sometimes referred to in the Bible as a mystery. That it wasn't always as, 
as, as well understood or, or even understood as it is today. You know, you and I have the Bible. We've been taught the Bible. We can read about Jesus and the life he came to live and what happened at the cross and, and why that was meaningful to us. And we can read about the beginning of the church. And to you and I, that's not a mystery. But it used to be. Colossians 1.26 reads, The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. You see, in Paul's day and in our day, this mystery has been revealed. It's been opened up. It's something we can all understand, and it was meant to be that way. But it was not always that way. You see, the coming of the Messiah for, for everyone was a form of mystery because you'd read pr prophets in the Old Testament talking about this coming Messiah that was going to sit on the throne of David forever. And they're thinking royalty and kingship and authority. And then another prophet talked about Jesus coming as a sheep to the slaughter. And no one... Not even the angels could figure out exactly how this coming of the Messiah was going to take place and what his ministry was going to be like. And it was only after the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus that all of the pieces of the puzzle came together and people could finally understand who the Messiah is and what he came to do. You know, that the Gentiles were included in God's plan of salvation was another mystery. There had been hints in the prophetic writings that, that the Gentiles would be included, but it really wasn't fully understood until the church began. And we know the struggles from reading the New Testament that the Jewish people had, that the Gentiles were being included. They just couldn't believe that this was God's plan. Colossians 1.27 tells us that another mystery was revealed. And this is the one we want to focus on today. Colossians 1.27, Paul wrote, To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is... Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you. The mystery God revealed was that Jesus Christ, when he comes to live in the hearts of the people, he does for those who believe in him. You know, most of us think about Jesus living up there in heaven, and that's exactly right because we know the Bible says that C Stephen saw uh, Jesus standing at the right hand of his father. But this passage teaches that Jesus also lives in the hearts of those who receive him. One of the great promises of Scripture is that Jesus Christ comes to live within those who believe in him. He's not just a historical figure that lives sometime in the past like Abraham Lincoln. He is not someone that lives just in a far off place. He comes to live within us, to empower us, to strengthen us. And no other religious leader makes that claim. Just before he died, Jesus said to his disciples in John 14, 16, he said, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Just as God the Father and God the Son are one, so Jesus and the Holy Spirit are one. 
And Jesus is saying to his disciples, I'm going to physically leave you. But the counselor will come to you. The Holy Spirit. And I will come to you. At the end of the very first gospel sermon, Peter told his listeners in Acts 2.38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When you accept Christ as your Savior and Lord, He doesn't, he doesn't just spiritually cleanse you. He comes to live in you. And this is what Paul is referring to in Colossians 1.27 as a mystery. Because even though sometimes you and I have trouble grabbing a hold of that concept, people outside of Christ think you're a loony tune. If you start talking to him about something like this. God came and lives in you? I'm not sure. You know, we don't all have the same emotional experience when Christ comes to live within us. Some are instantly overwhelmed with a sense of his presence. But others discover the Holy Spirit's presence gradually. His power becomes more evident to them over the passing of time. You know, a baby has hands at the time of birth. But they don't know they have them yet. It's going to be some time later before they finally look down and say, Hmm, who do these belong to? Oh, they belong to me. What do I do with them? And they study them. And they try to move them. And they reach for things. And they start learning they're useful. But over time, they gradually gain use of those hands. But even though they had them from the beginning, they didn't know they had them and they didn't understand how to use them. When you are born again, you are given the gift of the Holy Spirit Jesus comes to live within you and to empower you to live a victorious, meaningful, fulfilling Christian life. And you may know it instantly, but for most of us, it is a gradual discovering and a developing relationship. Now, this sounds a little bit like the class I was in on Wednesday night this past week with Alan. We talked about some of these same things. Today, I want us to see what Jesus does for us as he lives within us. I'm using four points on the back of your bulletin today as we think about Christ within. How does that help us? Well, Paul teaches us these things. First of all, with Christ in my life, I can face great trials. With Christ in my life, I can face great trials. You know, Paul had suffered a great deal through his adult life to present the Word of God to people. In 2 Corinthians 11, he recalls being put in prison many times, of being beaten eight times, of, of, of being stoned once, of being shipwrecked three times, that he had traveled through very hazardous regions and he had gone often without sleep and food and because of the lack of sufficient clothing, he had spent a lot of time being very, very cold. He'd been hated by his enemies and his own friends had deserted him. And then to make matters worse, Paul talks about a physical ailment that he suffered that he called a thorn in the flesh. But the only way Paul could endure all of this suffering was through the power of Christ living in him. He could proclaim the Word of God and continue doing this through his missionary journeys and the various time that he spent going places to tell others about Jesus. He could do all of these things because the power of Christ was living within him. 
He shares in Colossians 1, verses 24 and 25. He said, now I rejoice in what was suffered for you. And I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. For the sake of his body, which is the church, I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. Paul begins by saying he's, he rejoices in what he has suffered. In other words, he does not mind the fact that he has suffered a great deal to make sure that people get to hear the word of God. But then he goes on to talk about the fact that he fills up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. And there he's simply saying that his suffering is nothing compared to what Christ Jesus endured. But he's doing this because he was commissioned to proclaim the Word of God. And whatever suffering he had to endure, He would endure it with the power that Christ gave him. You and I today can be empowered in the face of the suffering we face by Christ living within us as well. You know, we sometimes look at the painful experiences of other people and say, you know, I don't think I could ever go through that. And we're kind of on the outside of someone else's suffering. And maybe we're praying for them. And maybe we really love them. But we're thinking in our minds. And maybe we say to others, you know, I could never go through something like that. You know, if I had cancer and I had to have that kind of surgery and those kind of treatments, I just couldn't make it. Or if my child died like theirs, I'd lose it. They might as well check me into a home somewhere I'd be lost or if my mate did that to me I wouldn't forgive them for a thousand years I don't know how they did that I couldn't do it but you really don't know what you can endure until the time comes because Christ is in you The Bible promises in that that well-known verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's true, isn't it? But a lot of times we don't have that power until we need it. And it's just enough. And God knows when that time comes, when you need something beyond yourself. And in that moment, that spirit living in you as a follower of Christ will give you just what you need to get through that. Alex, Alex mentioned a quote last week from Corey Ten Boom, and a lot of people have been inspired by her life. She grew up in a Dutch family and in the pre-World War II years and they were devout believers in Christ and their, their family followed him very closely but when, when the Nazis began moving in and occupying and taking over territories and eliminating uh, people that they did not want she and her family were drastically affected by that Cor- Corey and her sister were taken to a a concentration camp and her sister died there and Corey survived and she lived to, to 1983 but during the years she was living she spoke very openly about her faith in Christ and how God helped her and she told once of a conversation that, that took place be- between she and her father when she was just a little girl Daddy, she, she had said one day, I'm afraid that I will never be strong enough to be a martyr for Jesus Christ. Tell me, her father wisely responded, when you take a train trip to Amsterdam, when do I give you money for the ticket? Three weeks before? No, Daddy. You give me the money for the ticket 
just before we get on the train. That's right, he replied. And so it is with God's strength. Our wise Father in heaven knows when you're going to need things too. Today, you do not need the strength to be a martyr. But as soon as you are called upon for the honor of facing death for Jesus, he will supply the strength you need just in time. I took great comfort in my father's advice, Corey told her audience. Later I had to suffer for Jesus in a Nazi concentration camp. He indeed gave me all the courage and power I needed. You see, when God's Spirit lives in you, you may not feel what you have in advance, but you will always have just what you need at just the time you need it. You can count on it. Secondly, Paul says, with Christ in my life, I can boldly tell others about him. I can boldly tell others about him. Paul's conversion from Judaism to Christianity is very well known. It's a very dramatic story. He had stormed down the road to Damascus to persecute Christians. But outside the city, he was struck down by a a blazing light that left him blind and humiliated. And he called out, Lord, who are you? And a voice said, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. And he was led by the hand, blind, into the city of Damascus, where a man named Ananias came to him. And he placed his hands on Saul and he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately the Bible says something like scales fell from his eyes and he could see again. And the Bible says that he got up and was baptized. And as soon as Paul became a follower of Jesus and was filled with the Holy Spirit, he began to testify boldly about his faith in Jesus. Paul wrote in Colossians 1.28, we proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end I labor, struggling with all his energy which so powerfully works in me Paul's saying the boldness I got to testify about Jesus was through the Holy Spirit in me and in you you know since Jesus lives in you you have the power to witness beyond yourself I think most of us are afraid to speak openly about our faith. We're afraid we're going to be thought to be obnoxious or or we're going to be ridiculed for what we believe or somebody's going to ask us that question that we can't answer and we're going to look foolish. And so we kind of tiptoe around the outskirts of spiritual issues thinking maybe just hopefully I'll get a chance to invite someone to church. And certainly we want to be careful not to be obnoxious. But we often go to the opposite extreme and we don't say a word at all. We never bring the subject up. And in doing so, we never give the Holy Spirit a chance to be powerful through us. You know, if you try to witness, you'll discover one of two things happens. Either the Lord will give you the right things to say at the moment you speak, Or the Lord will use your awkwardness to open up the heart of an unbeliever. You just simply have to trust Him and use what He has given you. Thirdly, Paul says, with Christ in my life, I can discern truth from lies. I can discern truth from lies. The Apostle Paul faced all kinds of deceptive teachings in the first century. There was a group called the Gnostics. And they taught that all matter is evil. 
And so they said, therefore, if Jesus came in the flesh, he's of matter, and he was evil. So he must have not have been a real human being. And there were Judaizers who taught that, that all of the Old Testament law had to be obeyed in, in, in detail prior to become a Christian, or you couldn't be a follower of Christ. And so Paul and John and the other disciples had to counter a lot of these fine-sounding arguments that were throwing people off all over the place. He writes in Colossians 2, 2 through 4, My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. You see, persuasive things that are wrong aren't just in our time. They've been around a long, long time. Satan is so clever to twist stuff around, to take it away from its source. He's been doing it since the Garden of Eden. His tactics have not changed. And today he's spewing his same brick out there trying to pull people away from God. You know, after all, they say we're all going to the same place when we die. We're all going to heaven. We're just going down different roads to get there. Or they say, well, let's not be judgmental. I mean, who are we to tell anybody that they're wrong? Maybe they've been given a different truth than what we have been given. Or that God would never punish people if He's loving. If, if He is the God of love, then certainly He's, he's just, He's not going to punish anybody if they do something wrong. You know, if you and I just rely on human wisdom, fine sounding arguments will always tie you up in knots. And you'll sit there and think, you know, that does sound pretty good. I just don't know. I mean, I've been learning this at church, and, and this is so different. I mean, who's, who's really right? Well, if you're a Christian, you need to turn to the Bible. Because that's our source of authority. I think there are four fundamental... Uh, fundamental principles to the Christian faith that if you understand these it will give you a spirit of discernment about things that are right and wrong let me quickly walk through those four principles number one there is one true God who is the creator of the universe one only one true God who is the creator of all things secondly this God revealed himself perfectly in the person of Jesus. God in the flesh. Emmanuel. You know, all those things that we talk about at Christmas time and many other times, God perfectly revealed Himself in the person of Jesus. Third, the record of Jesus Christ is accurately preserved in the Bible. It's here. It has faced every test of scrutiny that there is. It's truth. The Bible says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and it trumps human reason, majority opinion, and political correctness. Fourth, the deeper truths of Scripture can only be understood by the power of the Holy Spirit living within you. You know, God has made the basics of salvation in the Bible so simple that a child can read them and understand them. But the deeper things of God in the Bible cannot be understood unless Christ is in you. And that's why things that you understand about the Bible when your Christian friends who, don't, who aren't followers of Christ hear the same thing, they don't understand them and they don't get it. 
but you because you have the Spirit of God in you because you study the Word and the Spirit reveals things to you you understand and you follow and your life is enriched and we pray for those who don't yet know Christ fourth Paul says with Christ in my life I can be faithful through the routine I can be faithful through the routine how many times do you hear Christian people say you know I've just gotten kind of stale you know I just kind of feel like one time I really loved the Lord and I was really passionate but you know somewhere along the way I kind of lost it and now I'm just kind of going through the motions all my passion's gone well, you know, we need to find ways to revitalize our faith when we come to times where things seem a little dry to us. But the Christian life is never intended to be one continuous high, you know. It's not life on the mountaintop every single day of life. <clears throat> I've always wondered about those people that every day, oh, praise the Lord, you know, it's just up and down, you know, everything's great and wonderful. And I'm kind of like, are you real? You know, can I pinch you to make sure? Because every day isn't that way for me. You know, marriage is a lot like the, the walk in Christ. And, and marriage is not one big honeymoon. I love my wife dearly. She loves me. But every day's not a picnic for us. I don't understand her. She doesn't understand me. We tell each other about it. Sometimes it's not real pretty. But you know, we know marriage is, is more than just feelings of goosebumps when you're around each other. Marriage is a lot about faithfulness you made a commitment and you worked through hard times in that commitment and there's going to be days you feel really good about your marriage and some days you wonder why am I with this person it's natural it's normal it's not about feelings it's about faithfulness and times there are the feelings but it's about faithfulness and there'll be times when you feel really great about your spiritual relationship. You know, you went to a great Bible study or you went to a concert or a conference and boy, you're just on fire and you've never felt closer to God and man, you just are ready to worship and serve. And I love those times. But for the most part, the Christian life has to be lived out in the daily routine. And so the question is, how firm is your faith in Christ in the routine? Paul wrote in Colossians 2.5, For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight in, to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. How firm is your faith in Christ? in the routine because your faith and you all know this will be tested it'll be tested often you'll be challenged by suffering you're going to endure things that you cannot understand while you're having to endure what you are your faith will be tested your faith will be tested by doubts your faith will be tested by temptations. Your faith will be tested by disappointments that come in life. But I really think the primary challenge to the faithfulness of Christians is the routine, the daily grind of living. Can you be faithful? The test of your Christian life, can your faith remain firm in the routine? in the sameness, in the daily grind of life. You know, some of you have understood that a lot of life is pretty tedious. There's always another dish to wash. There's another meal to cook. There's another old change. There's another bunch of laundry. There's another diaper. And the tediousness of tasks expresses your love the people in your household the people you work with the tediousness the grind of life but Jesus said if anyone is going to come after me 
he's going to have to deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. You see, when Christ is in you, you remain faithful even when it's not exciting, even when it feels like a grind. When your Bible study doesn't make the doesn't give you tingles, can you keep reading? When you don't see an immediate answer to prayer, do you keep praying? When someone says something that hurts your feelings at church, do you go back the next week? When that Bible study doesn't look all that interesting, but you're not in any other, will you go to that one anyway? You may not like the worship song. Does that mean you quit coming to worship? You see, how are you in the sameness, in the grind, in the day-to-day? Are you faithful? Because you love Christ and He is first in everything. You know how I tell if someone has Jesus living in them? It's not if they can speak in tongues. It's not if they raise their hands in worship and they pray with their eyes closed so tight they just look pious. I see Jesus in people when you're in and you're out. They're faithful. They're obedient to the call of Christ. In good times and in bad times. Because they love Him. And He's first in everything. Let's pray. Father, I'm so grateful to have a Savior who is faithful to his mission all the way through. Because, Father, without that, I wouldn't have eternal life. And so I'm grateful. And so I just seek in my own life, Father, strain toward his faithfulness. know that your spirit will help me that Jesus lives within me lives within all of us who have made a commitment to follow him thank you so much for this precious gift Jesus within Father when I look around and when I see how tough life can be may I never forget that I don't face things alone that Jesus lives in me. will never abandon, will never leave. Thank you so much. May we continue to live for you. In his name we pray. Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my dear brother, stand firm, but nothing move. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. There's a call throughout the Gospels, throughout the letters of the New Testament to be faithful. But to be faithful, we first of all have to begin the relationship that Jesus so freely extends to us with arms so wide open us to follow him. He wants us to receive the gift. He gave his life for us to have that is eternal life, that is the forgiveness of sin, that is a daily relationship with him that is lived out as part of a church, striving to make disciples of all nations, discipling those who gathered his family so that we can better go out, teach and baptize and lead people. receive Christ as your Savior, you can do that today. You can gather with any of us who are meeting here in the front. Take care of that today. If you'd like to know more, if you have questions about a 
walk with Christ, about what it means to follow Him, about what it means to be a part of His church. We're happy to talk to you about that. If you want someone just to pray with you today, about whatever it is, please come and talk to us. Whatever your decision is today, as we stand together and we worship, there'll be a number of us in different places in the world.